All good people, hello, I'm Dimitri. You're most likely are used to seeing Eber doing these, but you know, the last several months have been rough. And so some of the team is taking time to recharge and plan for 2021, but have no fear, Dimitri's here, all right? But anyway, after more than a year of rumors and the upcoming big Navi, we finally get to see what the RX 6800 XT and the RX 6800 are capable of. And those cards are so important because they bring the whole Radeon lineup right in line with the competition versus the best NVIDIA has to offer. Right away, let's talk about availability, okay? It's not going to be pretty. This is the expectation of 2020, but AMD had tried to maximize stock and allow board partners to sell the made by AMD reference design first and then followed by the custom designs later. Will that make a significant difference? Probably not. The truth is the situation isn't much different versus what happened last year with the RTX 2000 series launch and the RX 5700 XT launch too. And we're in the middle of a pandemic, so distribution and manufacturing are all affected. So yeah, it is getting really tiring and kind of frustrating to see everything from the Ryzen 5700X to the RTX 3090 sell out faster than we can blink. But I mean, the truth is we can't really do anything about that right now. But I don't wanna get stuck in a history lesson with you guys. So today we'll be doing our usual benchmark suite plus talking about new things like ray tracing uh smart access memory rage mode and all those things will be time stamped down below for your convenience let's begin this review right after this the new Corsair K100 RGB is a true flagship keyboard with 4000 Hz polling rate and new OPX optical mechanical switches, quality PBT keycaps, a gorgeous redesign all around, and a new IQ wheel that has a lot of functionality. Check out the K100 RGB down below. All right, so let's start things off with AMD's new RDNA 2 architecture and what they needed to do to bring this entire lineup into the competition with Nvidia's Ampere. Ampere, Ampere. To do that, they attacked four main areas over the first generation RDNA design. So increased number of compute units, boost bandwidth, make sure the core can clock higher, and also add some hardware elements to support DirectX 12 ultimate features like ray tracing. The crazy thing is they needed to accomplish all that without pushing through their power budgets and also sticking to that seven nanometer process because the last thing they needed was a, like a hot running power hungry design that limited performance. So the first step was to leverage AMD's lessons in designing CPUs to increase clock speeds while also lowering how much power was needed to hit a given frequency. And that means all of these new GPUs can actually reach over two gigahertz. And like you'll see in some cases, a lot more than that too, which is super exciting. Another thing that's been ported over from Ryzen is the Infinity Fabric and also what they're calling the Infinity Cache. Basically this massive 128 megabyte cache means that more game data can be kept locally on the GPU rather than being stored on the slower DRAM. This will decrease overall latency and also allow AMD to hit higher bandwidth numbers without taking up die space with more memory controllers or moving to expensive DRAM like HBM and GDDR. R6X. All of those have contributed to making RDNA 2 a huge generation step forward for Radeon lineup. More importantly, it's gonna allow them to roll out a more complete product stack from the high end to entry level, and hopefully even more competitive stuff on the notebook side as well. So this is the entire lineup right now, and it's obviously a super big jump over the RX 5700 XT. We will be looking at the 6900 XT when it hits later next month, but the RX 6800 and the RX 60 800 XT are actually quite different from one another. Sure, they both use the same 26.8 billion transistor Navi 21 core, but the 6800 is cut down quite significantly so it can hit a lower price point. This lineup is also a lot more expensive than previous generations, but that is because AMD is finally confident enough to realize that their GPUs are worth just as much as what Nvidia is charging. And speaking of how these line up with Nvidia RTX 3000 series, well, this is where things get really interesting. So back in the RTX 37 year review, we mentioned that Nvidia left a massive hole between it and the 3080, and AMD just drove their RX 6800 straight into that gap. At $580, it costs more than the 3070, but less than the 3080, and fun fact, it's meant to compete with neither. It also has a lot more memory than either Nvidia card and its board power is just a bit higher than the 3070. While the RX 6800 XT goes directly for the RTX 3080 throat while costing $50 less. Now that is of course on paper. Uh, we have no idea what retailers will actually end up charging for the RX 6800 XT because 
we are 100% think that is going to be a really popular card. As for the exterior impressions, here are the cards. They look pretty nice. If you want to see the 6800 XT in action, make sure to check out this super awesome build that Eber and Mike did over here. Sure, they don't have that unique heatsink design of Nvidia's Founders Edition, but there's nothing wrong with the downdraft cooler either. There's a few things that I want to point out though. Their length is just 10.5 inches long, so it will fit into more compact cases than the RTX 3080 Founders Edition would, but also also remember that 6800 XT uses a 2.5 slot design, whereas the 6800 is only a two slot card. I also like the fact that AMD is sticking to the normal 8 pin PCIe power connector for both of these cards, so you don't need that ridiculous dongle hanging off the GPU. The IO is interesting because AMD added a USB-C connection along the DisplayPort 1.4 and HDMI 2.1 plugs. The Type-C here is for VR headsets and other applications, but personally, I love this because for small form factor builds, you have this high bandwidth uh, capacity uh, USB-C connection at the back that you don't have to reroute with the case and all that. Brilliant. But to bring them down a little bit, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of talk about the following. What you just heard was inductor wine or coil wine on the reference 6800 XT. It's uh, higher pitched than like an opera singer. Sometimes it sounds like nail scratching on a chalkboard. It's super unpleasant. Uh, and you know, that's something that it will vary from sample to sample, but in an open test uh, bench environment, it is, uh, it is super unpleasant. Of course, you populate that inside a case. The mileage will vary on how loud the coil wine will be. Now, first of all, only the 6800 XT has the coil wine on, on our cards while the 6800 is completely silent. Also, most of the high pitched inductor noise happens when the card is running above 250 FPS, which is on par with like general coil wine. And that is because there's this variable power load on the card that causes additional stress on the chokes. In an open benchmark environment, obviously reviewers and us will bring this up, but it will be less noticeable when inside a case. Obviously having the card inside a case makes a huge difference in coil wine noise, but that is only masking the problem and not really fixing it. And with that out of the way, let's finally talk performance. We'll cover temperatures, uh, clock speeds and noise. Now the temperature side needs a bit of an explainer because AMD added a new junction temperature which measures the hottest part of the GPU while we still have the core temperature that averages out the temperature across the GPU. This version of Navi is expected and designed to run at a T-junction or the hotspot temperature of 110 degrees Celsius uh, during gaming, whereas your average temperature, which is what we normally see, is designed to be much lower than that. Starting with the RX 6800, it's a important to remember that AMD's paper spec have this card running at uh, up to 2105 megahertz. But we're seeing a lot more here, like 2300 megahertz on a normal basis, since it's taking advantage of additional power and thermal headroom to boost clocks even higher. Meanwhile, the temperatures are really well managed and even the hotspot, which doesn't get anywhere near AMD's 110 degrees Celsius max. Moving on to the 6800 XT, and the story here is pretty much the same, but the temperatures are slightly higher with the clock speeds tend to move around a bit more too. Here, the average speed is about 2350 megahertz, which again is a lot higher than advertised, but pretty normal. When it comes to noise, this is really impressive because usually with AMD reference cards, they're super loud and people needed to wait for board partner designs for silent operation but not this time. These are two of the quietest GPUs around and they easily match what Nvidia is putting out. Real-time power consumption sticks right below where AMD said it would for both cards with the RX 6800 XT around 300 watt mark, while the 6800 is just below 250 watts. When compared against Nvidia's cards, it looks like RDNA 2 might have the performance per watt factor nailed down, pretty damn good. Here's our test system and all the benchmarks have been redone with the Ryzen 9 5900X, which will also allow us to uh, test a few AMD specific features like smart access memory that we'll cover later in the review. So let's begin with some 1440p benchmarks. The RX 6800 XT trades blows with the RTX 3080 while being $50 cheaper and consuming less power. 
Guys, AMD promised and they delivered. I mean, I can't believe this is the day. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. But does it win convincingly? And that's the important question here. It really is dependent on the game. Some favor AMD, some favor Nvidia, but overall the RTX 30 is slightly faster on average, but the lower 1% lows are slightly better on the RX 6800 XT. The RX 6800 though is a bit of a different matter. And look, it's not meant to compete with the RTX 3070, but the competition is a bit closer than I thought. When it wins, it wins big in Doom, Red Dead Redemption 2 and Call of Duty, but in other titles, the RTX 3070 wins a lot. There's also a pretty big gap between it and the RX 6800 XT, even though they're separated by just $70. What this leads to is the RTX 3070 still being a performance per dollar leader at 1440p, provided a miracle can happen and you can actually find one at $500. Meanwhile, the two RX 6800 cards offer very similar value to one another, and both of those are a bit better than the RTX 3080, when averaged across all of the games we tested. But all of this is highly dependent if you can find any of these cards at the suggested retail prices. So good luck, have fun. But now let's move on to 4K and see if anything changes. The interesting thing about 4K benchmarks is that even though AMD cards have more video memory, it doesn't seem to matter. And that's because hardly any game are going to be bottlenecked by eight gigabytes or more of video memory, even at 4K. And sure, it may change in the future, but it is hard to tell since most games are limited by the GPU core itself long before memory size steps in. Either way, the RX 6800 XT and the 3080 and up being within like 5% of one another, while the RX 6800 splits the gap between the XT and the RTX 3070. So the positioning on the value side does tighten up a lot at 4K, with every card offering about the same performance per dollar. And what that means is that you'll get about the same frame rates relative to your investment, regardless of whether you can choose the 3070, the 3080, the 6800, or the 6800 XT. Even though none of them really stand out, it gives the buyers uh, some more choice when it comes to 4K gaming. But I do want to mention something about the RTX 3090 because Eber said in that review, it's priced way too high even for 4K gaming. And sure, if people wanna pay the premium to get the best of the best from Nvidia, but they're gonna have to do something about that $1,500 price point before the 6900 XT rolls out. The next stop on this review would be smart access memory uh, because it's unique to AMD and there's been a lot of talk about it since its announcement. From a quick perspective, smart access memory allows the CPU to harness all of the onboard memory and that could lead to performance increase in some situations. Before it was only able to access a map up to 256 megabytes of GPU's memory at once, which caused increased increased latency in some situations. That sounds pretty simple, but for most users, it actually isn't. First of all, you'll need a B550 or an X570 motherboard, along with the new Ryzen 5000 series processors and a fully updated BIOS. It looks like smart access memory is presented in a way to incentivize gamers to switch to a Ryzen 5000 series processors and to also pimp out the whole Zen ecosystem specifically for gamers. But due to a ton of compatibility issues, it will not be a enabled by default. However, users can go into the BIOS and enable the above 4G decoding and resize bar support. It might make it sound like uh, it's part of like some sort of proprietary thing that AMD developed, but it isn't. They're just taking advantage of the resizable bar support that's been part of the PCIe spec for years. Technically, it doesn't even need PCIe Gen 4, new CPUs, or even an AMD system for that matter. Nvidia could take advantage of smart access memory if they validate their own hardware and software. All it really needs is a system bias that speaks properly to the video bias. At this point, you're probably wondering why did it take this long for someone to roll out this resizable bar support into their software and bias. And that is because the benefits are super minimal for the amount of effort involved. Even though AMD claimed up to an 11% increase, those were obviously handpicked games because in the titles we tested, we got at most 4% and some games actually got worse frame rates. It also introduced enough crashes to our test system that required us to reinstall Windows just to finish some benchmarks. So I'm gonna call this a really interesting technology that will have some impact down the line, but as of right now, it really feels like a beta test. Beta, beta test, damn it. And now let's talk about ray tracing. That's a really important conversation for AMD. And we know that Nvidia has planted their feet into whole ray tracing and 
AI uh, image processing with DLSS, and they've been doing it for two years and they're continuing to push it. But AMD's ray tracing strategy is pretty different and a lot less ambitious and maybe a bit more realistic too, given the current state of graphics cards. Their thinking is more along the lines of helping developers use targeted ray tracing rather than spraying it all over the scene for no reason. Taking a more measured approach will probably mean current generation hardware will be better able to support these features without tanking frame rates, but it could also hold back development of more advanced features too. Anyways, AMD has packed what's called ray accelerators into each of their compute units. Just don't assume these have the same capabilities as the ones in Nvidia's Ampere cards since they're not integrated quite the same way. But one of the biggest differences is how RDNA 2 architecture handles ray tracing alongside typical shader operations. While Ampere can concurrently process shader and RT operations, Navi takes a more of a shared resource approach with its local cache so there could be bottlenecks when ray tracing is enabled. As for benchmarks, we're only testing the raw performance, so without any of the DLSS enabled, no super resolution, no fidelity effects, and no cast. We'll be doing a more in-depth look on those later. So things started pretty strong with Call of Duty, but you also can't forget how badly Nvidia lost in that game without ray tracing enabled. Other than that, the AMD cards do fall behind, but they don't really get like outright spanked by Nvidia like a lot of people might have been expecting. It should be really interesting to see how both of the sides play out as they start to sponsor games for their specific architecture in 2021. We shall see. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is Rage Mode, which is only available for the RX 6000 XT, and it's enabled through the Radeon software. All it does is increase the card's power limit and modifies its fan curve upwards without voiding the warranty. Right away, you can see the RX 6000 XT gets louder, but these decibel readings are still pretty low that you probably won't hear them over other things in your computer. And I gotta say that AMD did a fantastic job with this cooler design. And those increased fan speeds and the acoustic lead to an average core temperature that is actually lower than the default mode and clock speeds that were about 100 megahertz higher. What is not shown there is the junction or the hotspot temperature that hit 95 degrees Celsius, still below 110 degrees Celsius max, but it is climbing up there. And about that power limit, yeah, it's been increased by only about 15 to 20 watts, so it still doesn't hit the same level as Nvidia's RTX 3080. And performance, well, 100 megahertz boost isn't really worthwhile in real world situations, but when you combine rage mode and the small uplift from smart access memory in select titles, it's just enough to pull even or even beat Nvidia in some games. Whew, it is conclusion time, good people. So in the GPU world, it's important to deliver on your promises and after years of tailing, AMD has done it. RDNA 2 is Radeon's Zen moment as they're being able to catch up and finally compete versus Nvidia's best offerings. Whether you're team red or green, it is important to have this competition thriving and I'm happy that AMD's finally caught up. Their CPUs are amazing and now their GPUs are too. Right now, the RX 6800 XT is a really good alternative to the RTX 3080. It might not come on top every time, but it's $50 cheaper and consumes less power. That is a really interesting thing to say about an AMD card. Also, once smart access memory and other features roll out of the beta, it will even get better. The RX 6800 toe is a bit of a harder recommendation since its performance is similar to the $80 less expensive RTX 3070. Meanwhile, spending $70 more gets you a heck of a lot higher frame rates with the RX 6800 XT, but still nicely bridges the gap between those two GPUs. One pretty obvious thing though, the 12 gigabytes of VRAM is the reason why the RX 6800 is so expensive. And I mean, let's face it, even at 4K gaming, the 12 gigabytes of VRAM is mostly going to waste. Either way, the RX 6800 is something to really get excited about from AMD, and I hope that they can get into the hands of gamers and people who actually want them and not be just some distant thought that you might think about and be angry at reviewers because they have the cards and people can't buy them. But yeah, let me know what you think of this uh, launch. Check out this other relevant content, subscribe for more, and as Ebro always says, spend responsibly.